Welcome to another edition of Fireside Chat with Pastor Scott Aldhouse. I am thrilled to have you here today to try to encourage you and challenge you with the Word of God. And you're probably wondering why I have these goofy glasses on. Well, I'd like to ask you and like to talk to you today about seeing clearly. How do things look to you right now? You have 20-20 vision. You know, it's a very difficult thing in the world we live in to see properly and correctly. And you know that you can see without really seeing. And Jesus has a little bit to speak to us about that today. Our theme at the church this year is seeing clearly my Savior, myself, and my surroundings. And we're glad that you joined us today. And hopefully you already have a reading plan or a study plan for the book of Mark leading us up to Easter. You can get your own copy at fbchapel.org. That's fbchapel.org. And so let's go to the Lord together before we look into his word. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you know our hearts, that you know the struggles that we're going through, that you're a God who loves us and is concerned with us and desires to speak to our hearts today. Lord, we pray that you would open us up, that we might see your word clearly, to see you clearly through it. Thank you for your love and all that you do, Lord. We pray that you would just guide and direct our hearts. May you receive all the praise and glory, both now and forevermore. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Where our study today is based on the readings from last week, and it's in Mark chapter 8. So if you want to open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 8, Jesus is about to feed the 5,000. And it tells us in the beginning of chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, During those days, another large crowd gathered. <laughs> now, I read that much differently than I did a month ago. We're not even allowed to have a crowd right now. Things are shut down. And it makes this... A whole different passage and it makes me realize how much I miss getting together with all of you. How much I miss the corporate worship time. How, how much I miss just seeing you and talking to you. Maybe you feel some of the same way. And, and it's a struggle. But I want you to know that my very first point in this passage is there's something to see. And Jesus wants his disciples to see something. Well, look at verse number two. Jesus says this. He says, I have compassion for these people. Isn't that great that Jesus knows where we are? That he has compassion on us when we hurt, he hurts. That he's concerned about us. He wants to walk with us. And he's concerned about our needs. And they have a crisis here. They haven't eaten for three days. And these same people have been with Jesus. And he's, he's a, he says, if I send them home, they'll collapse on the way. He says, but I have compassion on him. And here's the interesting thing that he drags the disciples into the, into the problem. It's interesting. He says, I have compassion on them. If I send them home, they will collapse. But then he pulls his disciples together and say, hey, guys, what are we going to do about this? Where can we get some food? And the disciples go, we can't come up with enough food to feed these people. There's 4,000 people here. It's interesting, one of the things that I want to remind us of that is God allows difficulties into our lives because he has something for us to see. He wants to reveal something about himself to the disciples. And he's going to use their circumstance in order to do it. Their crisis, on, and they'll teach, he'll teach them through it. There's something that he wants them to see. Well, you may know the story. It's very similar to the way Jesus fed the 5,000, but here he feeds 4,000, and they have seven loaves of bread and a few small fish, and Jesus gives thanks, and he has the disciples distribute it, and they collect seven basketfuls of leftovers. So there's way more there than they started with. And so the 4,000 were there. It says they ate and they were satisfied. They picked up the leftovers. And we learned on down that the disciples have trouble seeing the lesson they were supposed to learn. So the first 
point is there's something to see. Jesus wants to teach us something. And through our struggles and our difficulties that we're going through now, this unprecedented time that none of us know what's coming. And we struggle with how long is this going to last? What's going to happen? I want you to know that Jesus wants to reveal himself to us through, his tru through our troubles. He wants to either show us his faithfulness or his love or his care or his strength or his wisdom in the midst of this. So as we continue on, we, we not only know there's something to see that Jesus wants to teach them a lesson, we also see that sometimes we have trouble seeing. I, I, we see this in verse number 14. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Now, I almost laugh when I read this passage because here's the disciples that had plenty of leftovers and plenty of bread and they aren't prepared. They had forgotten to bring bread. You know, the great thing about it as a disciple of Christ, the bottom line is that we're learning, that we're in a process of learning to trust God, learning to walk with God. It's not something that happens overnight. And the disciples had their bumps and their bruises and their faults, just like we do. Yet God is faithful in teaching us. God is faithful in revealing himself to us. So they're in the boat with Jesus after the feeding of the 5,000. They only have one loaf of bread. And Jesus warns them and says, Be careful, Jesus warned. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees, and Herod. And so they discussed this with one another and said, it's because we have no bread. They completely misread the problem. They thought Jesus was reprimanding them or warning them about not having bread. And yet we find in verse 17 that that's not Jesus's point at all. Look at verse 17, and where they're discussing, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? You, you guys don't get it. You just, you missed the whole lesson that I was trying to give you. He said, do you still not see or understand? Is, are things still fuzzy to you? Have you not figured it out yet? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see? Do you have ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? You know, I thought about this as I was reading and studying this, that oftentimes we see things, but we fail to see what God has for us. We're so wrapped up in the bread that we miss the very lesson that Jesus is trying to give us. We're so wrapped up into the world and that's our focus and our concern. And Jesus is trying to show them something. He's trying to teach them something. He's trying to get them to understand something. And it's not bread that he's talking about. It's not bread at all. So he says, you need to remember how easy it is for us to forget the faithfulness of God in our trials. How easy it is for us to forget the care that God has shown us in the past, his love in the past, and his faithfulness to us. And that never stops. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But just like, the, so there's something to see in the beginning, in this miracle of feeding the 4,000, there's something that Jesus wants to show them through the crisis. But the disciples have trouble seeing it. Just like you and I sometimes have trouble seeing God, what are you trying to show me? God, where are you? God, don't you love me anymore? What's happening? And there's a blind man that shows up in the story in verse 22. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. You know, I was thinking about this too, is oftentimes I'm trying to lead Jesus to where I want him to go. And here the blind man is led by Jesus himself. He's in the lead. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. And when he had spit on his, the man's eyes and put his hands on him, 
Jesus asked, do you see anything? And he looked up and he said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. Now, one of the things that we can gain from this short story of the blind man is, is that there's three different uh, degrees of sight. There's being blind, right? Not being able to see anything. There's having fuzzy sight. The, the man looked around and people looked like trees. And then there's the clarity when his eyes were opened and his sight was restored, as it said in verse 25. So let me ask you this question. In your experience and the way that life has changed and where you sit right now, can I ask you, what kind of sight do you have? You might be blind, and that is that you're in this darkness and this anxiety has filled your heart, and you don't know how you're ever going to get through it, and you're just stumbling. There's no confidence, there's, there's fear, there's darkness. Then there's the fuzzy sight. I wear glasses all the time. It's the last thing I take off at night and the first thing I put on in the morning. And, and let me tell you something, I need them. Because when I take them off, everything is blurry. You know, this situation is really blurry. We don't know how long this time spent in our homes is going to last. We don't know how uh, drastic the coronavirus is going to be. We don't know if there's going to be enough food or if we're going to have enough time or what, whatever the situation is, it can be fuzzy. We're, we're unsure. We're, we're not sure what's going on. And then there's the, the third phase of sight that we see here is seeing things clearly. And, and I don't know about you, but I've been having trouble seeing. I haven't been looking things through the eyes of God. I haven't been looking at them in any other way except a way in which we look at our world in a natural way. And I'm having trouble seeing. I'm having trouble not spending time with you. I'm, I'm having trouble staying to myself in my house. I'm, I'm having trouble speaking to a camera instead of a live audience. I'm having trouble in a lot of ways. And, and I need interaction. And so I, I can't tell you that I'm seeing clearly. And it's more fuzzy. And sometimes it's even blind. But Jesus has taken this whole chapter and wrapped it around what we can see. He starts out with the disciples and feeding the 4,000. He goes, God, guys, I have something to show you. And this difficulty is going to reveal something about me, something that I want you to see. There's a purpose for me allowing this and connecting you with this difficulty. And that purpose is I want you to see something about me clearer. We see the disciples and we see the actual reality of the, how difficult it is sometimes for us to see that we do have trouble seeing. That we can see, but we don't see with the right eyes. Instead, we see with our naturalize. So then Jesus goes along and they're walking and Jesus says to his disciple, who, is, who do people say that I am? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and some you're a prophet. So who do they perceive me to be is Jesus's question. Jesus's question is, is who do they see me as? Who am I to them? And then he gets super personal. And he goes, but what about you? And that's a singular. What about you? Who do you say I am? My third point is, I've changed this a bit. And I'm asking the question, who do you see I am? In other words, who do you perceive that I am? Who am I as this Jesus? What do you know about me? Who do you say that I'm at, I am? Who do you see that I am? Because you see, the way we answer that question 
has a definite impact and correlation with how we approach our lives. If we see Jesus just as a, a man, there's not much hope there. There's not much help there. But Peter says, you are the Messiah. You are the one that God has sent to deliver us, to give sight to the blind. You see, there's two people in chapter 8 that get their sight. There's not only the blind man that gets his physical sight, but there's Peter's sight, whose eyes opened up to the reality that Jesus is the Messiah, the, the, the anointed one, the one who would come and set the captives free. And when we put our glasses on, and we recognize Jesus as the Son of God, we start to gain confidence in what's happening around us. He then began to teach them in verse 31 that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders. He changed his emphasis to the disciples. It was no longer see who I am. It is now saying that who he was, was and what he was doing and that he was going to, must be killed, and after three days, rise again. You see, Jesus was no ordinary man. He was the Messiah. He is God himself in flesh. And he came to earth, and he was the only one ever to defeat death. And he is greater than death. So it matters when we look at this, when we put our glasses on, and when we look at our outside and our circumstances that we're going through now, it matters how we see Jesus. You know, there's um, a Psalm 46 that I, I really love that really has some great impact in our lives at a time like this. Listen to what it says and see if this doesn't sound like some of the things we're dealing with. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. He's saying here that the, the world has fallen apart, but I skipped the first verse. The first verse says, God, Jesus is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. He's our rock. He's the only thing that we can count on. He's the one who's defeated death. He's the one who, who loves us enough to die for us. He raised from the dead. That death cannot hold him down. That he gives total forgiveness. That he gives everlasting life. It says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. You see, if we see Jesus as being on the throne, if we see Jesus as being fully God, if we see Jesus as one who cares, if we see Jesus as one who has compassion, if we see Jesus as one who can open the eyes of the blind, if we see Jesus as one who can defeat death, if our view of Jesus and our certainty is that he is our rock and our, and our fortress, the Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. The psalmist is saying, though the world has fallen apart, there's one who stands, and the one who stands is God. And since Jesus is God, he's still standing. We got to put our glasses on because Jesus can be trusted. And there's something he wants to teach you and I. And here the disciples are, they're focused on the bread instead of the bread giver. And I wonder if we're not focused on the sickness more than we are on the Savior. You know, it's so easy to get sidetracked. We have to be prepared for the sickness, but we don't have to panic. God is still on his throne. Jesus is still at the right hand of the Father. And it's so easy to get sidetracked and to look at the bread. It's so easy to get sidetracked and to look at the government. But guess what? I don't put my trust in the government. I don't put my trust in my finances. I don't put my trust in the CDC. I don't put my trust in the health care system. I don't put my trust in this world. As a matter of fact, the follower of Jesus Christ puts his trust in the world to come. It cannot be shaken. Back to Psalm 46. 
It's what the writer says. Psalm 46. I'll find it. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. We will trust instead of fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. But here's the key. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Our trust is, be, our faith is being tested. The object of our faith is being tested. And if your faith is in your finances, you have reason to worry. If your faith is in this world, you have reason to worry. If your faith is in this life, you have reason to worry. But if your faith is in Jesus Christ, the rock, the fortress, our ever-present help in our time of need, what we'll learn is, is as we walk with him through this trial and through this chaos and through this struggle and through this crisis, we will learn something new about who he is. He desires to draw us close to him. So our challenge is, is to put on the right glasses. The world is much different than when we celebrated 2020, when people were wearing these. But the thing that's not any different is the faithfulness of our Savior, the goodness of our God. And we may look around and have trouble seeing, but Jesus is inviting us to come and see and to learn and it's based on who do we see that he is. He's trying to reveal to us that he's the one that we stand on. He's our foundation and he are, he's our rock. Can I tell you that that's a, a daily thing to have to struggle with? I, if I turn on the TV and I watch again and again and again the news and all the reports, it begins to eat away at it at me. If I could just for a minute go back to the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. I skipped over that because the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod was unbelief. They didn't trust. They didn't believe. They wanted to see another sign. And Jesus said, I'm not going to give you another sign. You're not going to trust me anyway. And, and Jesus said to the disciples, be aware of the yeast of the Pharisees. Unbelief. You know, I'm not a baker. I'm not much good in the kitchen, you know that if you know me. But here's what I know about yeast. Yeast goes and it spreads throughout the whole dough. And let me tell you something, the yeast of unbelief can spread throughout. And once we start to try, oh, doubt, and once we start to struggle, and once we start to, to move away from our focus being on God and our focus being on our circumstances, that unbelief hits me and then I worry, and then I, then I panic, then, then I get anxious thoughts. And what I do to combat that is I come back to the Word of God and I'm reminded that our God is faithful. I come back to the Word of God and recognize that Jesus cares where we are. I come back to the Word of God and realize that this world is not my home. And even if the coronavirus takes me home, if that's the method God uses, I will still go and spend eternity with him. And I want to encourage you today that God wants to walk with you, that Jesus wants to walk with you. And maybe you've never trusted Christ. Maybe you don't have the confidence that you belong to him, that you're his disciple, that you've given your life to him, that you've asked him to become your Lord and Savior. Well, can I tell you something at the end of this Chapter, Jesus is speaking, and he says, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Can I tell you, if your focus has been on this world, this should scare you. 
you should look at the circumstances of our world and say, I could easily die. What happens when I die? You know, there's no hope apart from Christ. Someday this world is going to pass away. But God's word lasts forever. And if your focus has only been on this world, we'd find that out in times like these. We find out whether we're truly trusting God or whether we're trusting in something else. And Jesus says, what good is it if a man gains the whole world and loses his soul? It reminds me of the story I saw on TV with the spring breakers. And one of the spring breakers says, I'm not going to let a little bit of coronavirus ruin my party. That's an earthly-minded person. That's a person who's focused on bread. And Jesus died on a cross that you and I may have, may have forgiveness. That we may have life after death. That we wouldn't lose our soul. But instead, we would gain eternity. And so I'm challenging you to open your heart to Jesus. Allow Him to, to come into your life by just admitting your sin. Because sin is what keeps us out of heaven. We're all born sinners. And Christ died to die, came to die on a cross. He took on human flesh in order to shed His own blood for the forgiveness of your sins and mine. And I'm going to heaven because I've trusted Christ as my Savior. Because I've asked Him to forgive me. Because I put my whole trust in Him. It's not me, but Him has done it for me. And that day that I gave my life to Christ sealed my eternity. And though this world is rocky and chaotic and in the midst of a crisis, my foundation is Christ and it's sure. And so that why gain the whole world and lose your soul? Jesus Christ wants us to give our hearts to him and gain all of eternity. Would you pray with me, Father, thank you for your words to us today. Father, we admit that there's times when we have trouble seeing what you're doing and who you are. Father, we admit that we focus on the bread instead of the bread giver. We, we focus on the sickness rather than our Savior. We focus on our trials and our troubles rather than your faithfulness. And God, you have a place for us if we've become your child and Father, I pray for anyone listening, anyone who's come across this message, this is a God-appointed God thing for them. And Father, I pray that they would understand that, that they are sinners, that they deserve your wrath. And this is nothing like what hell will be. And hell is what we deserve, but in your mercy and your grace, you've given us a Savior to pay for our sin. And when we trust him, when we ask him to to forgive our sin and to come into our life and to be the Lord and Savior of our life. You give us your righteousness. You cleanse our heart. You change our eternity. And you give us a place to live with you forever. Death is no, no longer scary. Death has now lost its sting because it, now we can have eternal life with you. Father, I pray that that they would make that decision for you. And Father, for those of us who have trusted you and that we're trusting you for our lives, Lord, help us to see you clearly. Lord, touch our eyes like you did the blind man. Lord, that we might see you and not be anxious or fearful, Lord, but we would exercise faith. Lord, help our faith, help our unbelief. Grow us up, reveal yourself to us. Help us to see you and things as they really are. Help us to see clearly. Father, we look forward to meeting together again in person with each other. We pray for the people that are struggling right now, that are having trouble with anxiety and anxious thoughts, Lord. We pray that they would get into your word and you would meet them there and you would bring them your peace. You are the, the Prince of Peace. And Father, we thank you for your love for us and the sending of your Son that he walks with us and teaches us. And though we don't walk with him perfectly, Lord, you walk beside us and give us your peace and your comfort. Lord, may you be glorified and honored. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been encouraged by today's message and we can be of any help to you or you would like to have 
a subject talked about on one of these fireside chats, I would encourage you to visit FBC, FB Chapel, F as in B as in boy, chapel, dot org, and that will, that will uh, get you in touch with us. You can email us. You can email your prayer request. We'd be happy to pray for you, any concerns or needs that you may have. And we will walk together with you in the middle of this as we both look to Jesus, as we point to him, as we see things clearly. And we put on our glasses, not to look foolish, but to see the faithful one.